here we go. Okay, so we left off uh, with the Beagle returning to England in 1836. Uh, Darwin visited his family for a while, uh, got an apartment in London uh, for a while, uh, but in 1842, he bought a house outside of uh, London, or at least it was outside at the time. Uh, now it's been kind of engulfed. Uh, it was in what used to be a separate village called Down, um, and this is Down House, uh, where he lived uh, until he died in 1880. Now I want to say eight. Now I want to say 1882. I think I said 1883 earlier, but I might have been mixing up his death with the date of the Krakatau volcanic eruption. Anyway, um, his family lived there until his wife passed in 1896, and it's a museum now uh, worth a visit if you ever go to London. And all this time that he'd been on the Beagle, he'd been writing up observations and notes and collecting uh, animals, plants, fossils, mineral samples, and sending them back. Uh, remember, Britain's got a global spanning navy at this time. You know, this is when, you know, Britannia rules the waves. And he had the privilege of, you know, shipping his collections back to England on any naval ship that they found that might be going in the opposite direction. Uh, so by the time he got home, uh, he had a very good reputation among the scientific community of his day. There's very few positions at this time for scientists as such. Um, though you still, you know, you couldn't get a, you know, major in science at most universities at the time, at any of them, really. Uh, we said this earlier that you, you got a university degree to do medicine, law, or theology, and that was pretty much it. So most science is being done by people we now, now call amateurs. Uh, doesn't mean that they were bad at it, it just means they weren't earning a living from it. Uh, but there was a community of people who might have day jobs or might be independently wealthy uh, but dedicated large parts of their time to scientific research. And it was this community that Darwin fell right into. Everybody wanted to meet him. Um, you know, people like Lyle were intensely interested in what he'd seen. Uh, he, and he had his hands full. He helped write up the official account of the voyage, worked on books of his own. Uh, he would end up writing 20 books in his lifetime and he collaborated on describing his, his finds with various experts. Uh, he also occupied himself with finding a wife, which he did in 1839. Um, that's his wife up at the top and below, uh, this is from Darwin's notebooks. Uh, being a rather methodical thinker, he wrote down a list of pros and cons for getting married. Uh, so this is his list of the advantages of having a wife. Uh, children, if it please God. Constant companion and friend in old age who will feel interested in one. Object to be beloved and played with better than a dog anyhow. I hope he didn't show his wife that. You know, home and someone to take care of house. Charms of music and female chit chat. These things good for one's health, but terrible loss of time. So he weighed up the pros and cons and eventually decided it was better to get married, which he did. And it was just as well because a few years after coming back, he started suffering from this chronic illness that would plague him for the rest of his life. Um, nobody is really sure what it was. Uh, it might have been a parasite infection that he picked up in South America, possibly uh, Chagas disease, uh, Nayeli, if you remember that. Uh, that's that trypanosome, uh, chronic bloodborne infection that you get from the bite of a blood-sucking uh, bug. Uh, 
and we know that Darwin did get bitten by one, uh, but his symptoms don't quite match. Uh, for a while, people thought it was psychological, possibly panic disorder. The latest paper I've seen actually suggests he had this mitochondrial condition uh, because um, his, um, you know, none of his sons or none of his children suffered from it, uh, but his mother had been sickly and his female relatives had, uh, which makes people think it might have been a defective mitochondrial gene, if you remember how those are inherited. Nobody really knows. What we do know is he was prone to bouts of terrible weakness. Uh, there were entire days when he was physically unable to get up off the couch. Um, he ended up, I mean, he kept working. Uh, he ended up uh, having his heavy books cut in half so that he could hold them uh, better uh, because he had to do a lot of reading while lying down. Um, he had uh, night terrors, uh, sometimes these bouts of weeping, um, digestive disturbances, uh, fits of vomiting. Um, he actually describes his digestive system functioning in some of his writings, um, which I won't bore you with, but um, yeah, the man was chronically ill for most of his adult life. Fortunately for him, his wife was very, very good at taking care of him. It's been said he was the ideal patient and she was the ideal nurse. Uh, you know, there are some wives who no doubt would have really gotten sick of that, but she was able to, to adapt to it, uh, adapt to a role as his caretaker. And I haven't mentioned this, but Darwin got quite a lot of money when his father died. Remember, his father had been independently wealthy. And that freed Darwin from ever having to seek paying employment. Uh, he was able to live off the family fortune. Doesn't mean he didn't work. As I said, he did end up writing 20 books in his lifetime. But it did... And in, in a way it was beneficial because it meant that he didn't have to spend eight hours a day earning a living. He could spend all of his time thinking about science, uh, doing some experiments that he could do at home in the greenhouse and in the fields. Um, and he was mostly freed from social responsibilities, from having to go to dinner parties and things like that, uh, which took up a lot of the time of wealthy people back in the day. And I should mention that he didn't just spend his dad's money, he invested it and kept very good track of his investments. Um, there are census forms that have survived and when Darwin had to fill them out under occupation, he wrote businessman. Uh, so he was an independently wealthy investor and that gave him time to devote to science uh, and also time to devote to being uh, to being sick. He was very fortunate uh, that, you know, he was, he was not required to join the workforce. Good for him. Right. He still found time and energy to ponder the problem of where species came from. This is a famous page from a notebook in 1837. Note your dates here. The beagle came back in 1836. This is some of the earliest documentation that we have showing that he's thinking about evolution. Um, if you notice, if you look at that branching diagram right there, it starts with a common ancestor here labeled one, and then one somehow gives rise to descendants. And some of those descendants don't go anywhere. Uh, in fact, a lot of them go extinct but you end up with descendant A over here and here's descendant B, C, D. So he's already thinking about how living species can change over time and they don't just change, they branch. One common ancestor can produce several, maybe many descendant species, uh, some of which might in fact be extinct. 
I mentioned this because there's a story going around and I've gotten it preached at me a couple of times by a woman who was supposedly present at Darwin's deathbed. And the story is that as Darwin was dying, he took back his evolutionary ideas and became a born again Christian. And, you know, she found him reading the book of Hebrews on his deathbed, things like that. And in that story, she claims that Darwin regretted ever coming up with evolution and said, you know, I was just throwing out some wild speculations and people ran with them and I never thought they'd take it seriously. The truth is the man was thinking hard about this sort of thing for over 20 years before he published anything about it. Um, think what you want to about Darwin's ideas. He was not randomly coming up with, with ideas that he pulled out of his, well, never mind where he pulled them out of. We actually have um, many volumes of his notes, of his notebooks, uh, and he wrote letters. Uh, back in the day, uh, the mail would come several times in a day, and you could actually carry on a conversation, uh, at least within England, by written mail almost as fast as you could do it by email now. And there's something on the order of 20,000 letters to and from Darwin that survived. So we actually know a great deal about what he was thinking and when he was thinking it. And we know that very soon after coming off the Beagle, he was thinking about the possibility of biological evolution. And he did a lot of reading, keeping up to date with the science of his time, but also reading works on economics and history and all of that liberal arts stuff that you probably didn't want to take because it got in the way of your major. And he had a great deal of influence coming from the works of these two gentlemen, Thomas Malthus and Adam Smith. Smith had already, you know, had, was already long deceased. Uh, he'd been a professor at Edinburgh, and he'd written a work called Wealth of Nations, uh, all the way back in 1776. His argument was that the best economy was one that allowed economic competition um, with, without government fixing prices and wages and things like that. If you have a bunch of competing enterprises, um, you know, competing for the same share of customers, the ones that charge more money than the customers want to pay will go out of business. Uh, the ones that produce an inferior product, they'll go out of business. Uh, the ones that charge a fair price will stay in business. The ones that innovate to produce better products and or cheaper products will stay in business and they'll thrive. And so the idea is that the free market will maximize profits, boost quality, make prices reasonable, and ultimately give you much better results than a top-down economy where the king or parliament or the you know, people's commissars or whatever it is set the prices and the uh, set the wages. He wasn't, how do I want to put this? He wasn't entirely total free market with no government controls at all. Uh, he recognized that a completely unregulated economy was prone to certain abuses. Uh, so he's not the super libertarian I'm making him out to be. But he's important for our purposes because he referred to competition in a free enterprise system as an invisible hand. That's his metaphor. And this is the beginning of our answer to Paley. Paley had said that if you have something complex, it must be designed by a designer. Smith is saying, OK, for something like an economy, it may be very complex, but you don't need to design it in that you don't need to have bureaucrats deciding how much of everything everybody's going to make, 
and how much it will cost and how much the workers get paid. Um, you can get order and complexity and innovation and improvement in an economy, not by designing it from the top down, not by some designer saying, you know, boom, this is how it is, but by allowing entities to compete. You know, entities like shop owners or something like that who may not want anything other than to make a good profit, out of their competition comes this complex, innovative, um, well-organized, and reasonably fair economy. That's the beginning of your answer to Paley. The other guy that he read was the work of a pastor named Thomas Malthus, uh, who'd written a book called Essay on the Principles of Population. Um, he's sort of a, a proto-sociologist, if you want to you know, identify him with a, a modern academic discipline. Malthus argued that in any given country, you could increase the food supply uh, by improving your agricultural techniques, uh, cultivating more land, um, breeding new varieties of crops and things like that. But the food supply would always increase in any given country as a linear function. The graph of food over time would go up in a straight line. The problem with that is that population increases exponentially. Right? Populations, exponential increase means that a population will double uh, over a fixed time interval. So if you have a thousand people in a village, after a certain length of time, there will be 2,000. And then after a certain length of time, a, a second length of time, there'll be 4,000, 8,000, 16,000, and so on. And that means that any population is always going to outstrip its available resources given enough time. There would always be poverty. You know, ultimately, there's not going to be enough to go around because no matter how much you work at increasing your resource base, your population is capable of outstripping that. Politically, what Malthus was arguing against was some early anarchist writers uh, who basically argued that the wealthy should be outlawed and have all of their wealth taken to feed the poor. It sounds like a nice idea at the first. Malthus's requirement was that wouldn't fix anything in the long term, because no matter how much you try to equalize everybody's income, eventually the population is going to outstrip the resource base, and somebody's going to end up getting the short end of the stick. He did, be it said, argue for various progressive things like increased opportunities for women. Uh, you can slow the rate of population growth by giving women more opportunities to do meaningful things with their lives uh, than stay barefoot and pregnant between the ages of 15 and 40. Um, so he did advocate for things like women's education, women's empowerment, and stuff like that. For our purposes here, this matters because Darwin happened to read Malthus in 1838, and it struck him that the same reasoning that Malthus applied to humans applied everywhere in nature. That you know, in a forest, there is only a fixed amount of solar energy falling on every square foot. Um, in a, any population of you know, animals, there's only a certain amount of food uh, available. And any population is capable of growing exponentially and eventually outstripping its resource base. Um, a population will eventually come to a point where the death rate increases to balance the birth rate. And as he put it, being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence, which everywhere goes on, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. In any population, some individuals survive and more importantly, they reproduce. 
and some don't, Darwin's insight was realizing that that's not random. Um, that what happens is individuals that vary in certain ways that are favorable are the ones that tend to leave offspring and individuals that vary in unfavorable ways don't. Given enough time, Darwin said, that will cause change and ultimately the formation of a new species. Here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. And he put everything together and got his grand idea, which he wrote about in a letter in 1844 to a botanist colleague. I determined blindly to collect every sort of fact which could bear any way on what our species. I am almost convinced, quite contrary to opinion I started with, that species are not immutable. Species are not unchanging. As he said, it is like confessing a murder. <laughs> and here's the way it works. This is Darwin's theory of natural selection. Uh, Darwin was not the first to propose that change happened. As I mentioned, that goes back to the, uh, the ancient Greeks. Darwin was also not the first to propose a theory of what caused biological evolution but he proposed the most successful theory of what causes biological evolution, and that's the theory of natural selection. It goes like this, individuals vary. Look at any population from people to, you know, plants, animals, anything you want to. The cats in my house, uh, the clover growing outside on the lawn, uh, the, COVID-19 virus uh, growing in the, the body of some anti-vax, anti-mask protester, whatever. All of those individuals are different from each other. And that variation is inherited. Individuals pass on their variant traits to any offspring that they have. You are different from everybody else on the planet if you have kids, your kids will inherit some of your traits and they'll look like you in important ways. Uh, even if you don't have kids, your parents had kids, at least I hope they did, and you have traits that you inherited from your parents. Now, this is now really obvious because we've got modern genetics and we have ways to explain this. But you have to remember that in Darwin's time, nobody understood how genetics worked. Um, in the 1840s, I think Gregor Mendel is like still a very young priest and he hasn't started his um, pea breeding projects yet. And even when he did publish his results, uh, nobody read them. Uh, they were left in obscurity uh, for 35 years. So you have to remember that not only Darwin, but every other scientist at the time was flying blind when it came to an understanding of genetics. Still, you don't really need to understand genetics because you can see this in your own family or in the family of you know, any organisms that you care to examine. You know, whether you're you know, breeding horses or raising chickens or growing heirloom tomatoes or anything like that, individuals vary and individuals pass that variation on to any offspring that they've got. Uh, so individuals vary in populations of every species from people to poppies to polistes paper wasps. Uh, these are paper wasps in the genus polistes uh, wa these wasps are actually capable of recognizing individual faces. And you can see that the faces of all of these wasps are different in you know, color and in proportions. The next part comes out of Malthus. In theory, any species is capable of increasing its population exponentially and indefinitely. Start with two bunny rabbits who like each other very much, and you'll get four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 
dot, dot, dot. We don't see this indefinite increase in nature. Um, what is it? Somebody worked out that if you had a single pair of fruit flies and you gave them perfect conditions and you let them breed as much as they could and all of their offspring survived and grew to adulthood and bred as much as they could and all of them had perfect conditions, just the right temperature and all the food and water they needed and so on, in a year you'd have a ball of flies the size of the earth. Obviously this does not happen. We do not have balls of flies the size of the earth Instead, populations tend to hold roughly constant, or at least they stay within certain limits most of the time. And the conclusion is that not all offspring survive. Not every fruit fly egg gets to grow up to an adult. Um, not every oyster in the ocean, not every bunny in the forest gets to grow up to be an adult and have lots of babies. There's just mathematically no way that it can happen. I mentioned oyster because if memory serves, a female oyster can produce something like 100 million eggs every year for 20 years, assuming she doesn't get hauled up out of the ocean and served on the half shell. If every one of those 100 million eggs every year for 20 years survived, we would rapidly run out of ocean because it would get filled with oysters. The vast majority of those eggs and babies that she produces die before reaching adulthood. There's no other way. This sets up what Darwin called a metaphorical struggle for existence. I should add, when I say the word struggle, what a lot of people think of is violent struggle, you know, about, you know, savage lions, you know, tearing apart the flesh of helpless gazelles, ruthlessly culling the weak so that only the strong can survive and, you know, that kind of stuff on animal planet. Or, you know, the savage shark ruthlessly culling the unfit mackerel or whatever it is. And I won't say that's not part of it, but the struggle can be, he pointed out, sometimes it's a struggle against the environment. You know, if you imagine a plant growing at the edge of a desert, you know, that plant could be said to be struggling, you know, even though it's not killing anybody, the plant is just, you know, trying to adapt to get enough water and nutrients to survive on. And the struggle could also be things like, you know, in a forest, the trees are not going around and punching each other. I mean, unless they're ants or something like that. But you know, aside from the ants, trees are not violent, but there is only so much solar energy in watts per square foot available in a forest. And if a tree grows tall, that means that it throws shade, haha, <laughs> see what I did there, at the plants underneath it, uh, which either have to try to outgrow the tree that's shading them or somehow adapt to live with less light or eventually get shaded out and die. So this is not necessarily violent, but it's still going on. You know, in any situation where you have a limited resource pool. And I, I guess I say that because people have the idea that natural selection is this bloodthirsty process. If I say the phrase survival of the fittest, people are going to think about ruthless hyenas tearing apart helpless meerkats or whatever it is that they're showing in the latest you know, documentaries. And I won't say that doesn't happen, but that's only the smallest part of what's going on. And the struggle does not have to be a violent physical struggle. Many times it isn't. So, but given that it's happening, given that the struggle is real, some individuals in any population will happen to vary in ways that increase the odds that they will not only survive, more importantly, the odds that they will reproduce. 
So if we have a population of bunny rabbits in the forest and some wolves move in, some of those bunny rabbits will be just a little bit faster and those have not a guarantee, but the greatest odds that they will survive and have baby bunny rabbits. Other rabbits vary in that they run a bit more slowly and those have the greatest odds of getting eaten before they can have babies. And it could be other things too. Some rabbits uh, will vary in such a way that they're better camouflaged and others will vary in such a way that makes them poorly camouflaged. Uh, some rabbits might vary in being more agile and able to make quick turns and shake off a pursuing wolf. Others will vary in the opposite direction. It could be a lot of different things, but some individuals will happen to vary in ways that increase the odds that they'll have kids. And of course, if they have kids, they will pass on those variant traits. The fast bunnies not only have the best odds of reproducing, their babies should be more like them. They should have fast offspring too. Repeat that for several generations and some traits in a population become common, others become rare and eventually disappear. That's natural selection. Given enough time, populations that are separate may be changed by natural selection so much that we can start calling them different species. That's the basics of it. Darwin decided he wanted to put his ideas to the test and he used artificial selection as an analog for natural selection. Uh, specifically, he started doing breeding experiments and anatomical studies on fancy pigeons, um, which he could raise at Down House, his country house. He had some uh, uh, pigeon coops uh, put in and raised various varieties of fancy ass pigeons. Now, there you have it, he says, believing that it is always best to study some special group, I have taken up domestic pigeons, kept every breed which I could purchase or obtain. The diversity of the breeds is something astonishing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with fancy pigeons. You know, we've all seen, you know, the little feathered rats that, you know, hang around and mug old ladies for their breadcrumbs. But there's a hobby to this day of people that breed fancy varieties of pigeon and, you know, take them to pigeon shows and show them off and try to win prizes and things like that. And there's a ridiculous number of breeds of very exotic looking pigeon. Uh, these are just a few. Uh, let me see there, I've got the pen. That right there, that's a fantail pigeon. Uh, noted for sticking its breast out so much you can hardly see its head and having this big fan of feathers, uh, twice as many tail feathers as a regular pigeon. Uh, this one right here in the center, uh, that's a barb, uh, which has these rings of naked flesh around its eyes. Uh, I believe that right there is a short-faced tumbler pigeon uh, with not only a very tiny and dainty beak, uh, but the ability to turn somersaults in midair as it's flying. Um, I think that's a nun pigeon because it's got kind of a, a hood of feathers on its head. There's crazy numbers of weird looking pigeons. They all come ultimately from this. This is the wild rock pigeon, Columbia levia, native to uh, I believe Southern Europe and Central Asia, but introduced to most continents. Uh, this is the one that you'll see around here. Um, there seems to be a colony that always lives out down by the railroad tracks in Conway. You've seen these guys before. Darwin goes into some detail and actually writes a little history of pigeon breeding, tracing the hobby back to ancient Egypt. 
breeders have produced a variety of pigeon breeds by picking out in their flocks individuals that have traits that they like, traits that are that are that are cool, beautiful, striking, advantageous in some way. Those breeders pick individuals that have traits they like, encourage those individuals to breed. Pigeons that don't have those traits end up on the hibachi or on the grill or in the soup or whatever you do with pigeons you don't want to keep. So you encourage the individuals with traits that you like to breed, discourage the ones that don't have those traits, repeat over many generations. And you go from the wild rock pigeon here to the Bahara trumpeter, uh, where the feet are completely um, hidden by these great big bunches of feathers, and the head is completely hidden by these big bunches of feathers on the shoulders. Um, or you, and by the way, because of its name, it doesn't make a cooing sound, it makes a trumpeting sort of sound. Uh, or you can end up with English powders, uh, which have this way of inflating their upper parts of the digestive tract uh, to make it look like their neck is blowing a giant bubble. Uh, there's a head in there somewhere, but that's the inflated neck. Uh, there's an English barb uh, with those uh, rings of uh, bare flesh, almost like you know chicken waddles. Uh, or turkey waddles, but around its eyes. Uh, the frill back has got curly feathers. Uh, there's the short face tumbler with that tiny little beak and bulging forehead uh, compared to a scandaroon pigeon with a great big hooked beak and so on. There's hundreds of really goofy looking pigeon varieties. They're different in pigeon in uh, feather color and feather length. Uh, but this is from one of Darwin's books. Uh, they differ in the skeleton as well. Up at the top left, that's the wild pigeon. That's the skull compared with the skull of a short-faced tumbler, an English carrier, and a Bagadotan carrier, which I think is the same as that Scandaroon pigeon uh, we saw on the previous slide. So you see that the length of the beak and even the proportions of the skull uh, can be altered. And even behavior and intelligence have been altered. That I actually knew somebody who had kept uh, fancy pigeons uh, and who had actually kept Bahara trumpeters. And he told me that not only were Baharas, those are the ones with those huge bunches of feathers that cover up their heads, not only do they have really big goofy feathers, uh, according to him, they're colossally stupid. Um, that they're basically just, you know, zucchini as far as intellect goes. Uh, on the other hand, homing pigeons, the ones that they used to use to carry messages as late as World War I, you can take a homing pigeon away from home as far as um, 1,100 miles and they can navigate their way back. Uh, pigeons have this ability to migrate by sensing magnetic fields. Uh, and they can fly back as fast as 50 miles an hour. Uh, people will actually race um, homing pigeons, you know, driving them away, letting them, driving them to a distant location, having them fly back and timing how long it takes. Uh, there's that short face tumbler again, which as I mentioned, uh, turns somersaults in midair as it's flying. On the right, a parlor roller pigeon is no longer able to fly, but it turns somersaults on the ground. Uh, I've actually seen footage of people uh, showing off their parlor rollers, and it looks like they're playing bocce ball. It looks like they're playing, you know, lawn bowling with these birds that flap their wings as they roll. And it, it's, they measure how far they can roll. It, it's, it's really kind of weird. And Darwin pointed out that this applies to a lot more than just pigeons. Pigeons was the example that he studied personally in some detail, uh, doing breeding experiments himself, studying skeletons and things. Uh, 
and writing letters to pigeon fanciers all over England. But it applies to a whole lot more examples. Uh, that's a wild plant that's native to the U.S.-Mexico border area uh, called the chiltepin, uh, capsicum annuum, a uh, rather attractive green plant with these bright red berries. Now, roughly 10,000 years ago, people started eating these bright red berries. These bright red berries protect themselves from getting eaten by mammals by producing large levels of a compound that causes intense pain. So the first people to eat these berries, swallow the berries, felt intense and agonizing pain in the mouth. And when they finally stopped screaming, one of them looked at the other and said, hey, let's do that again. I'm, I'm guessing alcohol was involved in there somewhere. Um, so they started harvesting chiltepin berries and noticing that if you planted chiltepin berries, you got chiltepin plants and noticing as you do that parental plants gave rise to offspring that looked like the parents. So they started picking out the chiltepin plants that had the largest berries, the most berries, the um, best tasting berries, uh, in some cases, milder berries that didn't burn quite so agonizingly when you put them in the mouth. And about 10,000 years later, the wild chiltepin berry has given rise to most of the varieties of peppers. Uh, there's a few that don't, uh, like habaneros come from a different wild species. Uh, so do ahi peppers. But most of what you'll see in your grocery store are all descended from chiltepines. Bell peppers, chiles poblanos, cayennes, jalapenos, serrano peppers, uh, ornamental peppers like these medusa peppers that you see at the lower right. They're all descended from Chiltepin. And we got them by thousands of years of artificial selection. Or consider tomatoes. That's a wild tomato that produces berries about the size of a Chiltepin. They're both roughly the size of, I don't know, maybe five millimeters or so, maybe a centimeter tops, but they're not very big. And starting with this wild currant tomato, breeders have developed everything from hollow tomatoes that you can stuff uh, to, um, I used to grow these, um, uh, what do they call these? Yellow, um, yellow pear tomatoes, small tasty tomatoes that are shaped like pears. Uh, green sausage tomatoes with a pleasant taste and a very elongated shape, which means that most of the slices come out the same size. Uh, Togo trifle tomatoes, which have that folded appearance all the way to, you know, Cherokee purple tomatoes and all those tomatoes, the, the Arkansas pink tomatoes that they grow down in the southwest part of this state. Um, you know, all the varieties that you could find at your local garden center at about this time. You know, tomatoes ranging from deep, you know, chocolate brown to orange to white to yellow, you know, enormous tomatoes and tiny little tomatoes, hundreds of tomato varieties, all derived from this one wild plant. And you can see this in everything from Okay, the, the goldfish at your local pet shop, there's dozens of different goldfish varieties and some of them look really weird. They're all descended from Asian carp. You know, similar to the carp that you might've caught in some of the, you know, lakes around here. Um, one of my favorites, cabbage. Wild cabbage is this dinky little weedy plant over the past 2,000 years, breeders have produced not just edible cabbage, but broccoli, cauliflower, uh, kohlrabi, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, 
all of them from this one dinky little wild plant that you'd step on without even noticing it was there all in the past 2000 years or so. It's everywhere. It shaped the modern world in profound ways. And Darwin didn't invent the idea of artificial selection. He learned about it by talking to animal and plant breeders. Um, he quoted one pigeon breeder that said, if memory serves, um, give me any beak shape that you can think of and I can produce it in five years. You know, breeders regarded, you know, varieties of animals and plants as something that you could mold and they did. And even so-called primitive peoples knew very well how artificial selection worked. Uh, this woman, uh, Buffalo Bird Woman is what her name translates to. She belonged to a native tribe that used to farm in the Missouri River Valley, uh, the Hidatsa. And she was interviewed by her grandson who could translate her, her language um, in 1912 and gave an account of how the Hidatsa used to farm. And in her account, she says, for example, I was very careful to select seed uh, for following point, seed should be of good color, seed should be plump and of good size. Did I learn from white men thus to select seed? Ha 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 ha. No, this custom comes down to us from very old times. You know, simply observing this process for thousands of years, people realized, you know, if you plant big, well colored plant seeds, your harvest will be big well-colored seeds. If you plant scrawny seeds, you'll get scrawny seeds back. People knew this very well because their livelihoods depended on it. So it might not seem that big a deal, but Darwin argued that natural processes did exactly what breeders could do, and that's exert control over which varieties of animal or plant reproduced. Breeders see variation and consciously pick out which variants will have babies and which won't. In natural selection, there's no conscious breeder. What there is is the environment that, even though it's not, we don't think of it as a conscious, conscious thing, it exerts a similar type of selection. You know, the choice of which individuals in a wild population get to have babies and which one don't, which ones don't, is not made entirely randomly. Instead, you can think of it as being made by the cumulative effects of the environment. That's what does the selection. Given millions of years, natural selection should be able to create this incredible diversity of life from a few simple predecessors if you gave it enough time. I'm gonna go ahead and pause there and we'll answer this objection that I've raised at the end. Uh, I have got 956. Um, what the heck, I feel like I'm making good time. Uh, let's reconvene at 1010. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording here.